Now, Don always tells me, please bring a European perspective. When I go, when I'm in Europe, they tell me, please bring an American perspective. When I'm in Catalonia, they say, all right, bring a general European perspective. I go to Italy, they want a Catalan perspective. And this morning, I was talking on Russian TV, you know, and I'm involved in this Russian thing on the side of, I don't know, either a Hillary or Trump, we'll see. But uh, so I was talking on Russian TV of the about the Italian elections that I know anything about. So, but uh, I do know certain things. Otherwise, I wouldn't be a full professor. This uh, so basically, it's the modern state, the modern state, and the American tradition, and this kind of comparison. Now, there is one thing I have to tell you. America is still freer than any other place on earth. There's no doubt about that. In Italy, they had this discussion whether you had to ban the Roman salute, right? So unfortunately, unfor there were two or three judges that were not total morons, and they said, no, it's not a crime and it's not even a misdemeanor. Otherwise, imagine yourself calling a cab and they <laughs> take a picture of you and you are indicted, right? So this is like, totally stupid, right, because it's a fascist remnant. But these kind of things about the past are happening nowadays in the United States. And we were talking about all these things. And uh, there's, you probably know that Madame de Stel, or Stahl actually, said the very famous thing that liberty is ancient and tyranny is modern. And in no other country than other than the United States, this is more true. It is very true because this country was certainly conceived in liberty. And it's not dying, but it's not going on as free as it used to be. And America is destined to look more and more like Europe. See what happened a few days ago with the, this Yankee thing going on with the Patriots against the Philadelphia and so. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and so the, the, the guys that lost us started to riot. That sounds like soccer in Europe, you know. It's not the NFL. The NFL was different, you know. They might get a little bit drunk, but not, not so out of hand, right? Riots. So it's uh, really uh, this... this this idea, as I said yesterday, of American exceptionalism is um, it's a very bizarre idea. It was a Cold War tool. It was invented by people drawing on Tocqueville and these... Or, by the way, Tocqueville was very important for certain things, but you have to realize that the guy was here for a few months, spoke no English, talked to a couple of people who knew French, went back and wrote everything about America, right? <laughs> so it is this inferiority complex that America's had for uh, European intellectuals for uh, almost 200 years that made this guy so big. You know, think about what ta good old Tocqueville wrote about the Union. In 1832 he was here. And he should have seen it coming. There was a nullification crisis and so on. He said, the union is beneficial to every section of the country. <laughs> to the south, to the west, to the north. No problem whatsoever. That is in democracy in America. You can look it up. That's how much Tocqueville understood about America. But the thing is, he wanted to see in America the future of Europe. Now, if you want to get a glimpse of the future of America, you have to look at the past, a European past. And... Uh, and so this is, uh, there is no exceptionalism and uh, especially these, it has created this idea of American exceptionalism by the so-called consensus historians, right? You're familiar with these uh, guys, uh, the Schlesing Schlesingers, Jr. and the others, the people that said that there were no conflicts whatsoever in America. I'm not, the Declaration is exactly the same thing as the Constitution. And, uh, and so on. Actually, I don't know why 100,000 loyalists were kicked out right after the American Revolution if they were all the same, right? There was a certain radicalism and there were clashes. There was everything. And the United States at the beginning was feared. The thing that the founding fathers feared the most was to become another Europe. And they said it all the times, right? It said, no, we don't want to become like the monarchies of Europe. So we're going to look for certain things. John Adams 
says, well, we, we have to draw from uh, the ancient and the modern leagues, the Amphictyonics, the Olynthian, the Arcadian. I wonder what he knew about all these things. But anyway, the confederacies of the Greeks and then the general diet of the Swiss cantons and the states general of the United Netherlands. The union of the Hanseatic towns, which have been found to answer the purposes both of government and liberty. Very few examples. He was not talking about the Kingdom of France. He was certainly not talking about the monarchy of England and so on. So there were very few examples from the past and from the present that they were trying to use. And they were all federal, right? So they had local components, clearly. So, but then something happened even prior to the Civil War. You know, it was, uh, well, started with some people that started to talk about the Union. In American political thought, for at least 100 years, the Union became the substitute of the King and the Parliament in Europe, right? Every time they were talking about the Union, they actually meant the King, the supreme power of command, the single room where you decide everything, and it's still there. It is called the Union, it's the White House, it's Congress, it's, uh, you, can, you could uh, name it. So the importation of the categories of the modern state came to America through the war and through Lincoln. Now, this is very complex. If you studied as a political student or a student of political thought, you will realize that it's really very difficult to pinpoint where and how good old Abe learned anything, well anything, stop, but anything about the modern state, right? He never read Rousseau, he never read Hobbes, he never read the classics, but he was singing the same tune. It is somehow pretty amazing, you know, but if you look at the political thought of uh, Abraham Lincoln before, he was this most amazing politician of the history of the United States. You know, you put Bill Clinton together with the, well, not the wife, but other <laughs> politician, <laughs> Kennedy and the others, and uh, times them by 100 and you get uh, very slick politician. But the thing is, if you take a look at the discourses, speeches and so on that he wrote, there's no political thought involved. There's no deep learning. Deep, Pretty much nothing. I remember my father was a physicist, and um, it seems that in physics there is a big problem. It is the perfect vacuum. And I remember that title of a book that he had in the library. It was In Search of a Perfect Vacuum. I don't know, but as a kid, it stayed in my mind a lot. So I just, I did like science, so I thought I was going to solve the problem. And it was Lincoln. I mean, if you look for his political thought, it's a perfect vacuum. There is nothing in it, right? So that is, that is really amazing. But the thing he accomplished are so sophisticated as bringing all the categories of the modern state in America through the Union. And we said it this morning, and it's really clear. He, said, he wrote it in a very famous letter. I want to make my point clear. I didn't do it for the black people. You know, don't, don't short of saying, I don't kill them all to save the union. He says everything. If I could have saved the union, letting them all slaves, I would have done it. If I could have saved the union. So I did it for the union. He says it clearly. And the union is really the tool for the importation of the modern state. Now, it was none other than the great philosopher Hegel that understood something about America and the modern state when he was talking about it. Now, this is from the Philosophy of History, a book that uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with as a philosopher. It was lectures that he gave. And he, I mean, this great mind, he, was, he used to talk about all sorts of things. He says, just as, as we all know, Brazilians are very lazy. I wonder when good old Hegel met a Brazilian. But anyway, he just knew they were lazy and so on. But he says about the new free states, note the plural, of North America, and this is in the 1820s, right? And he says, North America is for the moment a state that is still forming, a state in process that does not yet need a monarchy because it has not yet developed to that point. You see? So that, was, that is the Hamiltonian 
program, and which is, well, Hegelian if he was more profound. It is a federal state. These are the worst states with respect to their foreign affairs. When its lands will have been fully occupied such that societal pressure will turn in upon itself and the need to commercial and industrial activity will arise, then the state will have necessarily developed to the point of obtaining a new constitution, right? And he was talking about becoming a real centralized state. It took, clearly, a civil war for that. Now, when you think, go, let's go back to the consensus historians. Consensus. Now, this country, the central theme of this country's history is a civil war. How can you predicate the whole story about consensus, right? If you have one single thing, which was the bloodiest war of the 1800s, and it is clearly a civil war, right? So this, uh, but at the end of the civil war, and of course you know that um, Karl Marx, Karl Marx loved the United States, right? He loved the United States and hated Russia. Imagine that. <laughs> Pretty bizarre. You know, he wrote all sorts of uh, disgusting things about the Russian peasants and people that uh, it was all these writings were purged by Stalin, and so he could publish it. But he loved the United States. He moved the first international in New York because he thought he thought he was the most modern country of the future. And he he wrote all sorts of articles in favor of Lincoln, and uh, and he loved the United States for another reason. He got it was the only country that gave him some money, and so Engels would come back. You know they, they would both write something for the Morning Star and so on. So it would come back, there's a check from the United States, oh, you're giving it to me, right? It's handouts you give me all the time. No, they're actually paying to write. It was the only country on earth, and it still is, where if you write something, you get some money. So <laughs> that's what uh, Karl Marx really liked. You know, it's like quite the opposite fate of Freud. Freud hated the United States, right? But uh, the fate Freud wouldn't be so big in the history of uh, if, he, if he was if he were not adopted by the American bourgeoisie, right? And uh, but Karl Marx luckily had little impact outside of academia, at least in uh, in, in the American popular co culture. And then and then clearly with that war, something happened. Or Karl Marx says now at this point the United States is the most modern country and nation on earth. Now at this point I wanted to give you a sort of a short lecture on the modern state. Uh, I do have a class in English in Milan with um, more than 200 people from all over the world. Now when I, to explain that the state is only modern and to just put it into their heads it takes about eight hours to Italians and Germans. 12 hours to the French, but just because they're slower. Uh, the, uh, the Eastern guys still want to hear about that, because it's soon, you know, Russians and so on. As soon as I, t they're so nationalistic that as soon as I tell them that they made no contribution whatsoever in the forming of the modern state, they stop listening. So that's their problem. Unfortunately, with the, like, five or six or 10 Americans that I have every year in my class in Milan. It takes about 20 hours. And it's not because they're dumber. It is because they've been trained in school to talk about the polis as the city state. And then the Roman Empire was a state, not to speak of the Roman Republic, which was a, even a better state, right? So it's, um, it's almost impossible. So after, even from some uh, scholars in the United States are still convinced that the state is modern in its modern form. And so you'd have a medieval state, ancient state, and so on. Now it's, uh, it makes uh, no sense at all. After, actually it's the, the, the term, we should, just disc we, should, we should just call it the state. Because the state is modern, sovereign, of European origins. Every time you say state, you mean only one thing. It started around, well, it depends, you know, 1400s, 1500s, and so on. But, so it is, so the medieval, the ancient world had nothing, nothing comparable to this organization of power that is come and grad, coming gradually to the United States and been working on it for the past 200 years. 
And uh, there's my mentor, who uh, was a great political scientist, he said, today's political order, far from being the sole and inevitable product of universal reason, is rather the unintentional result of a series of historical junctures. It just happened. It came out, and it was the answer. It's a specific modern answer to the Middle Ages. Now, if you want to think about any, anything, right, you have to go to the birth. Right? Even nowadays, you have, if you want to understand something about even America, you have to go to the birth of America and try to go on from there. If you have to understand the Catholic Church, you have to think of the collapse of the Roman Empire. Right? And everything that happened in the, in the last two centuries of the Roman Empire, where all the bishops became the clerks of the empire. And not only so this, this dominion that came and the kingdom and so on and the rest of the, in the Middle Ages was right there uh, from the beginning. So what is a modern state? The modern state is the modern answer to the problem of political order. Now what was the problem in the medieval ages? Plurality. The beginning of modern times in Europe you had 500 political communities, none of whom, which was totally autonomous or sovereign or anything, but where there were semi-sovereign and so on, 500. At the beginning of the 1900s, there were only 19 out of these. So clearly the modern state won as a matter of political organization. There is no doubt about that. It won, you see the Westphalian system, as it is called, or, uh, I remember I was, just, uh, I was writing a paper and uh, there was this lady who was, uh, who was just uh, typing it in the old days and uh, it came out, I read it, it was the West Philadelphia Treaty. No, it's Westphalia, right? Not West, <laughs> West Philadelphia Treaty. <laughs> I was, I was reading the West Philadelphia Treaty of 1648, it's such an amazing importance all over the world. But now, you take a look at the Westphalian system and it involved few small area of the world. And now it's all over the world, two, more, almost 200, some, some people say more than 200, some people say less, but let's say 200 states. And they're actually states, no doubt about it. Now they are. And so it, it, there's no doubt that it was a super success. And uh, it was also the grand design of the European political tradition. And it's a fiction. It's a fiction that you have to use all the times, the common good, all these kind of things. I mean. If you were going to tell in any political election, I'll get there to advantage my family and my friends, and uh, we'll steal as much as we can, you know, from the public. Well, you wouldn't get that far. But if you start talking about all sorts of the common good and this discourse that's behind the idea of the states, it's really a masterpiece of the Western political mind and political culture. And also, you know, it comes from, I'm not saying that it's a totally novel from the institutional point of view, but it uses ancient Greek notions, ideas like it's better to be governed by laws than by men, which is a very bizarre idea. And when I, you know, it's a, if you ask a classical liberal of any kind, would you rather be governed by men, by nice people, good men or bad laws? They'd say, ah, too complicated, I'll go for bad laws. Well, not really. I mean, so most of the times you get bad people make bad laws. Laws just don't come from God. You know, they're made by bad people. And if they're made by people, they will be made in favor of a group of people and against another group. I mean, it's like uh, this idea of government by laws. It's a little bit more, more complicated than it sounds. So it's the political class is really forced to hide beyond, behind this notion of the impersonal command of the state and the laws. Now, the historiography of the modern state started around the end of the First World War. You had to, there was something incredible, you know, so many deaths. 12 million people died in Europe. And you, you were right this morning when you said that uh, the crucial thing was the American intervention, it would change the whole thing and the whole history. But anyway, all these deaths, they just had to study a bit more what happened. Nothing of that sort ever happened before. You know, you take all 
let's call them private debts in the history of mankind, going up to the wars, European wars of the first part of the past century. They don't put them together, they don't count for more than like two days on the Eastern Front. <laughs> it's like, uh, and you put them, the Inquisition all together, the Mafia, Gaudi, <laughs> whatever they, you know, all, they all come up together and it's just a um, little particle of what the state caused in terms of violence. So they started to question certain things and it's mainly German scholars. Max Weber, Otto Brunner, and, uh, and other very important scholars, German scholars. And uh, so it seems the, all this, you probably are familiar with this idea that the state is the legitimate monopoly of violence. It's Max Weber's definition. It's been criticized, but it's the most famous definition in the history of the social sciences of the state. I and mean, it's been criticized. It's the monopoly of the legitimate force. You can say it violence force, I mean, no prudery as far as this is concerned. Right, so if you think about monopolizing violence, it's a totally modern thing. Never occurred in medieval times. You know, there were, uh, there were kings and there were other political communities, but clearly they had no intention to monopolize violence. Now this is the only trait of a modern state that's still not here in America. Gun control, arms, that's why they're pushing it very far and uh, they wait all the times and they go for gun, when they come and take your guns it will be the last chapter of America becoming a full-fledged modern state. Right? Because this is the only thing that separates Switzerland and America from the rest of the world. By the way, the only two countries that were born federal. I don't know if there still are, and there still are, especially the Swiss, but that were born, that were born federal, that is, as pockets of resistance against the modern state. Now, most of the people would tell you that the world is so complex and complicated that you need a modern state to manage things. Now, there is nothing more untrue than this statement. The modern state is the most simplified version of politics that there is on earth. It's a military version of politics. It says, let's put someone in command. Let's create a single command room for 324 million Americans. And that's all we want. And we'll take and we'll make and we'll come up with any decisions in that single command room. Now this is centralization of power. This is the number one political program of the modern state. Now the other one is equally important and is to cast every political relationship in terms of law, juridical. You know, sometimes my, well my students, any, any of my students from all over the world, they've been so brainwashed that I don't even understand that there is a difference between a constitution and other laws that regulate relationships between people. I said, is the Constitution really a law or is it a political document? They've been so brainwashed because they call it public law and they call it constitutional law and so on. So they go there and I think that like constitutional decisions are technical decisions. This is the dream of the modern state, you know, to come there and to tell them, oh, it's a technical thing. There's nothing we can do about it. We're going to steal 55% of what you make every year because of a technical, it's a technicality that's screwing you up and screwing you over. So it's, uh, there's nothing you can do about it if you present it uh, this way. But uh, clearly, one mo in, at the beginning of the modern times, there was one thing that uh, marked, and this is very ironic, though thinkers of the modern state, they promised territorial peace, right? They said uh, that, uh, in fact, Marsilius of Padua called his great sort of uh, the first defense of a kind of idea of the modern state, he called it the defensor patris, defensor of peace. He, was, he wanted to defend freedom because he said the real threat to peace, the threat to peace comes 
from the universal ideas, that is the church, the empire, will make peace locally, right? He never understood that this local, this system of glo local peace would lead to global war at a certain sense. And most of us do not think that uh, war is in the horizon. I'm not, I actually, I would, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a major war in the, pa in the next 10 or 15, 15 years, because that's really in the nature of what was called the warfare welfare state, which is global, universal vocation. But, you know, so program, mo number one program of the modern state, centralization of power. Create one single command room for the whole territory. Uh, the number two is to recast, to use sort of juridical clothes for relationships that are actually relationships of power. So you have to use this kind of thing. The regulatory machine should be there. It should become an institution. Le temps emerge, I mean, the state never dies, right? As they used to say in France, but it was not the state. It was, it was first le roi, like the king never dies. But, so the king had, there were two bodies of the king. One was mortal, the other one was immortal. And that brings us to the discussion of sovereignty, which is the most complicated subject because it was used in the American context, but it is very different from the heavy European notion of sovereignty. And it really, st do, do you guys know when it was used for the first time, this word ever? Well, first of all, you're not professional philosophers, but you do know that if something does not have a name, it does not exist, right, at least. <laughs> so if there was some, if it came up in a certain date, at a certain time, in a certain book, it probably means uh, something, right? Do you, do you guys know? I know what, what is the Bible? The Bible, sovereignty in the Bible. No, that would have been pretty ancient. 1576, Bodin. The six books of the Republic, or so-called the six books of the state. You got it right. I mean, you're a professional scholar. Come on. So, uh, usually, I promise. I promise my students, I'll give you your euro. No, no, euro is nothing. So I'll give you five euros. If I could, I could give them two thousand euros. They'd never come up with these answers. So, forget it. So, but the term, the notion. Now, one real problem we have in our mind is that sovereignty exists in nature like it's a chemical thing. It was found out at a certain point. Now this is the problem. The state is an invention, not a discovery, right? So it's an invention during a certain period of European history. It was very popular. It's common every day. It's already, it already is right here, but it's not a discovery. That means it's not something that was there in nature. So a lot of people, even scholars, would tell me when I talk about the state, they say, oh, but they had this, if they, they didn't have the name sovereignty, but they had the same thing in China 5,000 years ago. And I said, all right, all right, yeah, well, what can you say, right? They do not understand that it is the word and the debate over sovereignty that went on and on in Europe for 400 years that created sovereignty itself. You know, it's like saying there's, if you playing chess, right, there's a rook and a bishop, but you go out, you're not playing chess anymore. There's no rook, no bishop, you're outside of that game. So that bishop does not exist if you don't know it's that it moves in diagonal or the rook and so on. So it's part of a very simple game and that the rules of chess create that reality. So the discussion on sovereignty created the idea of sovereignty itself. This is the difficulty of the modern state that a lot of people just do not understand. And uh, it's the, I would say, the philosophical difficulty to understand that uh, the sovereign state is the answer, and a certain answer, a European answer to the problem of political order. Now, 1576, first time it was used during the so-called during the so-called French religious wars, right? Second against the Huguenots, who were the Calvinists in France, and they were. Finally, in the end, uh, the, the Catholic one. So that was used for the very first time. And uh, Jean Baudin realized that there was no way of solving the conflict 
between predestination and Catholicism. The only way was to recognize a king, a sovereign power above them all. all right, so that was the first use is you are part of a sovereign state, not because you have the same religion, same language, same laws. These are fine, but, but the thing is you're part of the same, if you have the same leader, if you share the same political leader. Now, do, does anybody know where the, the, the inventor, the first time actually that the term state was used? Five dollars. All right, you got. You, you said it before. I said five dollars. So. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, you should have waited. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's uh, it's better to wait a little bit. But Machiavelli in the Prince, he's the very first guy who uses the state pretty much the way that uh, American teachers in high school would use it. In fact, he says, well republics, kingdoms, and so on. They're all states, right? All, everything that should be called a state. So you, he used it as, in a sense, in a way that uh, the Germans would say, Oberbegriff, a super concept for political, political community. But what came with Machiavelli was a certain important mark of the modern state that is a double, double standard for the statesman and for the private citizen. Right? You should not judge. The, the only canon for the, for the new ruler, for the prince, was success, nothing else. You know? And then with Giovanni Botero, The Reason of State in 1589, that's a great book that opens really the modern era. And he says, well, if the leader acts for the salvation of the state, he will go to heaven no matter what he does. You know, he kills a little infant in cradle, it doesn't matter because he's acting for the salvation of the state. Wait, he's not saying like Machiavelli who didn't believe in God. He said he's excused because power in itself is important. No, he says he will go to heaven. You see, at least in medieval times, I'm sure a lot of kings behaved pretty badly, but the common people at least thought they could rot in hell for eternity. But no, not even that. In modern times, you have to even think that they will be uh, part, that salvation will, be, will bring them in, uh, in, uh, in heaven. Now, a little brief thing. So it's not sovereignty, and the sovereignty is, is an idea that cannot be traced back to the Middle Ages. There's nothing you can do about it. It's impossible. Not only the word, but the concept and the way it used. Sovereignty is really a cluster of ideas that introduces us to modernity. In a certain sense, when John Calhoun was using the word sovereignty, that is what I argue in my book, he was using a very, very complex term. I mean, it was not as heavy as in the European tradition, but it was dangerous to use even the word sovereignty. And in fact, Jefferson never used the word sovereignty in his life. One morning, he woke up and said, sovereignty, that's it. But he never wrote it down. <laughs> you never know, right? So, so but what, what does it mean? It means no foreign interference of any kind. You know, so you have, of course, we, it's, and nations or places, states, come in all shapes and size. There is Russia, there is the United States, and then there is San Marino, right? So small, so it's, but that's a different story. It doesn't tell us anything about problems of power, powerful states. But they do respect each other in a world made of states. Now that's a hint why Rome could never be considered a state. To be a state, you have to be in a world made of states where you recognize other states. You may want to build a wall, but you do recognize there are other states, Canada and, are they building a wall to Canada? No, I don't know. Anyway, so and other walls that were already there and so on. But actually it's, you rec and Rome just thought it was the government of the civilized world. Outside Rome there were only barbarians, so it would be impossible to think of Rome as a state. Now it's really a pluralistic arrangement and uh, it is really the grammar of politics in the modern time. Now the problem with sovereignty it is that it was very much connected 
to the body of the king. So it passed, there was this dynastic principle that in the 1700s, for instance, it was as important as it is democracy nowadays to legitimize power. Well, you probably read about all these wars for succession. Can you imagine just going to war with another country in Europe because you do not recognize the line of legitimate dynastic succession, right? This is pretty amazing. But nowadays, if any country of a certain importance in Europe would just stop having elections and uh, parliaments and so on, probably they, they would be subject to war because that's the way you legitimize power. And that was the way with uh, the ancient family. So it moved, it's a very flexible concept. It moved from the body of the king to the mystical body of the nation with the Jacobins. And in England, pretty much the same thing. They were talking about the people in the 1600s, but it was actually the parliament. So all this talk about the people and in 16, started in the 1640s and so on, and it ended up with the sovereignty of the parliament, not sovereignty of the people. And uh, in, uh, in a certain sense, the, in the, the United States, of course, there was never a king. So this idea of the sovereignty of the people was a fiction that was there from the beginning. And if it, if it never moves to a single people of the United States, and which does not exist from the constitutional point of view, as you know, we're still safe. If it moves and it creates the idea of a single people instead, you know, the nation, the nation, the land, this land, and so on, then something good might still happen. So it's really a system, single system of, single universal system of locally sovereign state. But now, in modern times, not everywhere the state won. Do I have a lot of time? We'll see. A reasonable amount of time. So it's, it's, there are some areas in modern times that are not part of this modern state story. Now, the modern state, see, the, the, the simple model, France. France is the political model, European most advanced model in Karl Marx's eyes, and England, and then the United States would be the social model, which goes totally against dialectical mat materialism, right? Because if it is the, the most advanced societies should have the most advanced political response, but it didn't work like that at Karl Marx. So Karl Marx, so this idea is you have a king, then you kill the king, then the sovereignty passes and goes to the mystical body or the mystical idea of the state. And the rest, some of the rest of the areas were late, as historians say, they were late in discovering this universal reason and to govern. So it was the Netherlands, the Republic of Venice when it lasted. It was another area, a very important one, it was called the Hansa, right? The Confederacy of the Hansa. Now this German guy, this French guy, foreign minister goes in 1610 to the Hansa. And, and so he's got to talk and say, all right, talk to the foreign minister. There's, uh, and says, well, sorry, there's no foreign minister. Well, you've got to talk to somebody, some authorities. We, we have to write. We have to come up with a treaty with them. So, so, uh, and he goes on like two years looking for who. He says, well, I'm sorry, we just, we're just a confederation. There's, there's nothing going on. We just uh, get together sometimes and come to our diet, and we'll see what we can do. But uh, the diet was so strict that uh, it just, uh, they, they would just uh, sum up uh, the whole thing maybe twice or three times in 10 years. Or so there was really no authority whatsoever. So all these areas, uh, to all these areas, you have to add the American Republic, early Republic up to the Civil War, which was clearly the most modern society already on Earth. All sorts of things were happening, parties, movements and so on, but there was something that clearly was not there in the so-called, we could call it the Philadelphia system instead of the Westphalian system. And there was something clear, it was a different system created on and based on a different idea. So it was, um, was designed, and there were all the institutions in America were actually designed to avoid the Europeanization of North American politics. 
So it's really federalism and also, I mean, it's like the modern state. The modern state happened by chance, by chance, and as an answer or the political answer to the disorder of the Middle Ages. Same thing happened with federalism. It's not a conscious uh, uh, thing that came out as the most important American contribution to the art of government. You know, this uh, amazing uh, and stupid things that scholars say about the federalist or the new constitution and this thing. You know, they don't even mention the anti-federalist, the real federalist as they were. But anyway, so it's everything, all these things, all these arrangements happen by chance. But remember what Thomas Jefferson said, the United States are and please always say the United States are. I mean, you, you're native speakers. I mean, you want to be, forget bad English, the United States is. The United States are a nation for special, special purposes only, right? So this, this was Thomas Jefferson and not to, and, uh, and so the same thing could be said of Calhoun, though the U, he said uh, the U.S. is not a nation, but an assemblage of nations. Now, what is going, do I have five minutes? Yes, at least, thanks. Now, what, what I wanted, to, what I really think is going on at this point is not only the coming of the final chapter of the coming of the modern state to America, but it's in this final chapter, there's something pretty bad that's going on, and it is a new way of looking at the relationship between civil society and the state. I will make it as simple as possible. At the beginning, the the political view of the relationship between society and the state, now this is only a modern thing. There was no difference between society and the state or society of political power in ancient times. If you would have said it to Aristotle, who said, what are you talking about? Man is a zone politicon, so what? It would be totally not understood. But this, so it started with Adam Ferguson, 1767. And so there's sort of the invention of the word political, civil society as opposed to the state. But now Tom Paine in Common Sense says society in every state is a blessing, but government, even if it's in its best state, is but a necessary evil. In its worst state, an intolerable one, right? So this, was, this would have been the normal idea of most of the founding fathers uh, and, uh, and so on. So the first, the first avenue of the destruction of the American experiment in self-government, we talked about it this morning. And it was really to consider federalism as racism. It started with the Civil War and it went on with the desegregation movement and uh, this notion of unconditional unionism was used, and of course it was, uh, maybe it was a necessity, but clearly the federal government showed that it had uh, the moral, the ethical upper hand against the, uh, the states, right? So this, this was clearly something uh, that, that happened. It became crystal clear. You had to defend the freedom of the minorities against a majority in a state that was oppressing the minority and through federal coercion, who cares about the Constitution when morality is there, right? Then there was another avenue of destroying the United States. Now we, we would like to think that the United States is a capitalistic country and we like to think that it's socialism is a bad word. We know it's not there anymore, but it was a bad word during the Cold War cause socialism you know, it was, they were the enemies. So there was something good about the Cold War, actually. You know, the communists were the enemies. There was, uh, I always defend even Joe McCarty, everything, you know, just the, uh, the Committee of Un-American Activities. Oh, good guys. Anyway, uh, so it's, but the, the free market was hated by intellectuals in America at the beginning of the century in the 1930s and so on, not by the common people. They just, they just wanted, they didn't hate the money, they just wanted more. But uh, so at a certain point, and during the Cold War, America had a Tocquevillian moment, right? You probably know that, uh, that Tocqueville said uh, that the, at the end, the two mortal enemies would be the United States and Russia. And he said, uh, the, cons the conquests of the American are made with a plowshare of the laborer, those of the Russian with the sword of the soldier. 
To attain this goal, the first relies on personal interest, and the second concentrates all the power of society in one man in the state. So he says in the United States is a power of society, in Russia, the power of the state. So that uh, at least during the Cold War, it was easy to believe so. Nowadays, you know that millennials are telling us that, what was it, 42% in the last poll, that they said they would rather live under socialism. They don't know they're living under socialism, right? So they, it was the rather thing part that sort of uh, scared me. They're stupid. What, what, what more socialism do you want, right? It's, uh, anyway, so it's, uh, I'm sure there's, there, you, can, you can get some more, right? And, uh, however, it was a very superficial love affair of the intellectuals with free enterprise and capitalism. There is a, there is a great article, you might want to read it, it's, uh, it's called, it's, is there a free market economist on the house? So it's, there was a poll of all American economists, and it seems only 3% believe in the free market, 3%. And they are economists, right? They see that somehow it works or it brings about. So this is, so we are now moving to the last stage, and the last stage is very simple. It's a new view of the relationship between civil society and the states. It's a Hegelian view of that relationship. And uh, civil society for Hegel was, he calls it the system of needs. And it gives us a spectacle of ex extravagance. It is split. It's the reign of uh, disharmony, antagonism, and so on. There might be freedom, he says. In fact, he says a lot of th things. You know, you work with others, you exchange. There could be some freedoms. But, of course, you need the state to make it universal, to change from the particular. So the system of needs, the system of free interaction, he says, must be subordinated to the higher authority and compulsion of the state. And this is a common view also in America nowadays. And also, while Karl Marx, his most important disciple, of course, of Hegel, thought that the state was simply the instrument or the tool of class despotism, that changed, which, which was, of course, a much more realistic way of looking at the state than some uh, idea, than the idea that the Kennedys are going to protect the poor people, you know, stuff like that that's uh, very common in this country and all over the world. You know, this, this other of the rich will protect the poor from the fury of the rich. And it's, it's a bizarre thing. So, but uh, there was the very important Austro-Marxian of the 1920s, Karl Renner, who said, while the market is the instrument of the bourgeoisie, the state is the political tool of the proletariat. It's pretty funny from the Marxist point of view, right? It makes no sense at all, but still. The old, the totally American and sound European classical liberal idea that the state is a parasite of society that promotes an incessant struggle between taxpayers and tax consumers, such as it is, is depicted in the disquisition of government, is disappearing from the American political discourse as well as from the European one. Now, I'll finish just quoting Calhoun, and you're very familiar that uh, he makes this difference Taxpayers versus tax consumers, right? He says the action of government will always create two great classes. They're not created by society. They're not, they are created autonomously by politics. And it is taxpayers and tax consumers. So it's those who pay taxes and bear the exclusive burden of supporting the government and uh, the other people are those who are recipients of the proceeds of taxes. So there is actually not a class struggle, not a class warfare, but a tax warfare. And it goes on much more so in our days than in his days. In his days, he didn't deny that the South had slaves. He just said, we are fiscal slaves of the North. <laughs> right? So you're actually using our slaves to make us your own slaves. That's what he says in... Uh, the South Carolina Exposition and Protest of 1828. Now, I, re I really finish right now, but I want to give you some hope, yeah. right? Do you want some hope? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's some hope. 
a tone of hope for the future of this uh, country, especially this part of the country, because I don't care too much about the rest, to tell you the truth. <laughs> you know, plus, there, there's one thing we never, we just, we, we don't talk about, it's the weather, right? And so we would like the tradition, politics, people, everything, and it's good, but the weather is fantastic. It's really amazing. Sometimes I just uh, open my eyes in Milan and it's raining and it's uh, like uh, raining humid and, and I think to myself, what the f am I doing here? <laughs> now, anyway, so, and, uh, so let's, uh, let's give a tone of hope. In 2016, something happened. There was a presidential election, if you didn't know, and the taxpayers defeated uh, the tax consumers. Right, if you take a look, it is it's very simple. You take, you take a look and you move, you, even in the states that voted for, um, what, what it was the Republican candidate? Anyway, that, that voted for Trump, even, you take a look and you move to the Capitol, so more government jobs and so on, and they voted for Clinton. You know, it's a very simple thing. People that rely on taxes voted for her and the others voted for the other candidate, and now we'll give him credit for the rest of his life for defeating the most crooked politician there ever was. So, and uh, you know, I don't care. People say he's a protectionist. Yeah, I couldn't care less, frankly. So, and and actually, also they defeated uh, Hillary, Billary. What, what, what's her name anyway? Uh, Billary, Billary, Killary, Hitlery. <laughs> so they they defeated her using not democracy, because if this country was already a fully full-fledged modern state like France, he would have lost and she would have won, right? So they defeated her using the framework's design, federalism, the state, and also against the unchecked power of certain states, that is California, New York, and Illinois. So maybe they elected a leader who's not too sound, has not extremely articulate. I, actually, he talk, it's the way he speaks. I like it. I mean, I like it because I, I spend a lot of times in bars talking to people. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just you have to like uh, la populace, as they say in French. But uh, to like this guy, but I like him. He's a straight guy. And. Uh, but in the end, this election could be really the turning point because it was something that could not have happened, should not have happened. It was something that tells us something important. And it means that in spite of the logic of the modern state that's really iron, and uh, there, is, there is also something that could happen and could change the whole story. And uh, the modern world is really, and the fate of this, part of the country is really not necessitated at all to use a favorite Hegelian term. Thank you.